Welcome. So uh, my name is Christian. I work here in the Berlin. <clears throat> I joined the company almost two years ago, and I have been working in Qt for Python full time. So um, the the idea of the first talk. I mean, if you saw in the program, I also have a second one. So if you want to maybe uh, skip the second one or the other way around, is that uh, the first one will be more like a, what we have now and what we can get in the future for as Qt for Python project. And the next one is more focused on like if you have already some C++ project, how you can bring these things to Python so you can make it interact with the thing that we will show now. <clears throat> so just I usually kind of ask people around like who has never used Qt for Python before? <clears throat> okay, so we have a new people group. Cool. So uh, maybe this is a little bit too advanced, like not really a step-by-step -step tutorial. So. Don't expect that, but uh, hopefully you can get some ideas there. There is uh, a couple of webinars already out there, so if you really want more like introduction stuff, you can check it out. So uh, first database application with Google Python in 0, 0.0 days. How much time is that? So it's 15 minutes. But uh, yeah, I mean we will do it in less. Um, so let's start. <clears throat> As you might know. Data science is kind of like a really hot topic nowadays, and uh, everyone is doing machine learning, even if they don't know what they want it for. I mean, but you know, everyone wants to have machine learning solutions everywhere, right? So <clears throat> this is a really nice field. Everyone is kind of learning all these uh, new frameworks, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and all these kind of things. And now, for example, the latest versions of uh, TensorFlow, you can run it on your mobile phone, and everyone is kind of really into it. But what is the reality of <clears throat> data science, at least from my perspective, from people that I have talked in the US and here in Europe, <clears throat> most of the time is handling data, cleaning CSVs, different encoding, missing values, and stuff like that. So it's like, yeah, after you have your really nice clean set of data, then you do all the machine learning stuff. So that's why I want to focus on like how as cute we can help improving this management of data. And when you say management, it's kind of like displaying information in way, maybe some plots, maybe some tables, and this kind of things. <clears throat> so Python is kind of being used mainly because there are many numerical modules out there that uh, kind of change the paradigm in Python itself. The math module in Python was OK for basic stuff. But when you really want performance stuff, there was nothing out. So when NumPy was out, it was kind of like you know, a big thing. And it was so fast. And the reason it was so fast is you can, you can read it there. I mean, uh, it's easy to integrate with C++, C++, and Fortran, because most of the mathematical modules is are written in Fortran itself. So if you clone the repository and do a grep, like most of the files are Fortran files. So. Um, <clears throat> The more powerful thing that NumPy uh, gave us an introduction was this concept of n-dimensional array object, which is something that was not in Python before. But this is still was an array. So still people was able to go there by indices. So it's kind of a messy if you have you know, some, some three-dimensional data or even more dimensions, then you have like, you know, a lot of index. And it was kind of complicated. That's why maybe if you're familiar with Python, it's, do we have here Python developers that doesn't do anything but Python developers, no? Maybe some brave people? OK, no? Yeah, maybe? OK, good. <clears throat> because usually for, with the new developers that are kind of doing data science stuff, these are like kind of like things that they assume that they are there, right? But the problem with this, as I said, it was too many dimensions were really, really difficult. If I have, I don't know, like 200 columns, it was still it was kind of like a pain. So that's why <clears throat> people thought about this thing. And they started to say, OK, right, what if we start to provide the same functionalities as NumPy arrays, but in a more label way? So the people from behind Pandas decide, OK, so we will kind of like have this similar approach, based our solutions on what they did, but use on label data. So that's why, for example, now it's kind of the de facto module in Python for reading CSV or Excel sheets and these kind of things. And the amount of tool also that there is a model is really, really impressive. <clears throat> so. When we are talking about data representation in C++, I'm really ignorant about data representation or plotting libraries in C++. I know Qt charts, and that's it. There's maybe if you know another one, there is a couple. But in Python, there is <clears throat> the main one, which is Matplotlib, which is kind of 
define the, the basis of what a module need to be able to kind of be uh, Python friendly, to call it one, that way. Um, and I started to, you know, kind of like settle all the basis of the amount of things that you can do. And since it was Python, then in three lines, you have an amazing plot and everything, right? But also there are other stuff like Plotly, that also you can do nice uh, plots. Bokeh, that you can do interactive HTML vice uh, plots. And then you have Dash and Seaborn and ggplot, by there's like 1,000 of them. So <clears throat> there are many options out there. So the idea will be, from our point of view, is that uh, we need to kind of find a way how we kind of integrate this new ecosystem that we're adopting since last year, right? So the, regarding the data workflow, um, it's kind of like I really would like to have at some point, uh, I know that I have a microphone and you don't, but uh, some kind of discussion if, do we have some people here working with data like every day, like, you know, a couple of hands? It's really important for us as a project to kind of hear your user cases because, I mean, in my brain, everything, okay, I read this uh, CSV file and that's it, right? But of course, you do many other things, right? And you know, you have some REST API that you're requesting or maybe you have data in JSON format or whatever other format. So we need to know as Cube for Python, like what are your use cases so we can try to build some stuff on top of it and provide better solutions, widget base or QML base or whatever. <clears throat> so regarding the workflow of data scientists nowadays, they kind of tend to install Python with uh, this Anaconda thing that is called the Python uh, uh, package manager and they use Jupyter notebooks. So if you are not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, um, I can just show you one simple Jupyter Notebook. So the idea of the Jupyter Notebook, who he doesn't know Jupyter Notebooks? Okay, so we still have some hands. The idea is to have a website, well, it's kind of a web server that you have locally running, but you can visualize it in any browser. And then you have the same idea if maybe you are familiar with, um, what is the name? Uh, Mm, MATLAB. MATLAB, I think it introduced the concept of notebooks. And the idea was to have this kind of like dashboard that you can manipulate and modify it. So you have different cells there. You have in one, two, three. So you can execute them separately. So for example, if he, by some weird reason in the second one I have an error, I can just run that section, just that section again. And instead of running again the import and everything. So there is a Python kernel running there. So most of the data scientists use this because, of course, it's, it's not an ID. Well, it's, it's kind of an ID, but it's more like an ID. And it's quite convenient, right? Because they want to know at each step if everything is fine or not. So the, the idea here is that after they have everything, usually they end up with something like this, you know, like a fancy plot that was showing some important information. <clears throat> the problem that I see with this is that <clears throat> nowadays the tendency is that people have these nice notebooks and they, they have these nice plots and they want to deploy this because they want to share it inside a company, inside the project, whatever, so other people can use it. So they either have, they pass the whole Jupyter notebook or a standalone application. I have seen some people trying to deploy kind of like a Chromium-based solution, like single window with the thing running on top. So it's, that's kind of not optimal, right? I mean, we're going all the way to web and then generating another browser just to have the same thing that we can have in any simple interface, not even QML, just with widgets. So this is the part that I was telling you, like it would be really beneficial for kind of the project itself to know the different uh, um, workflows and cases so we can see what we can put like on top of PySide 2. <clears throat> so the idea uh, now is that, I mean, is since you were new to PySite uh, 2, a couple of you, uh, compared to what we have in Qt for installing it, it's really straightforward. So if you're not familiar with it, it's just running pip install PySite 2 and then you have it. So no Qt installer, online installer, user, password, you know, selecting the version, preview, you know, this is not existent. Just with this command, which is kind of like the de facto way of installing packages in, in Python with pip, you're going to specify this. If you want a specific version, somehow you are restricted to 5.12, you're going to specify it also there as an argument. So it's kind of easy, right? I mean, you install it like this, and then you are ready to prototype. So this is one of the things that we are kind of offering to already existing C++ developer, right? I mean, we know we like C++, that's why we are here. But uh, this is a really quick way 
to, to, to achieve two things. First, uh, fast prototyping, and the other one is like, uh, if you have someone new, completely new to, to Qt, you, could, you can just you know, install this, start doing writing some code, see if it works, if it doesn't, that's it. No compiling process, no. so you can have something easy to get in touch with Qt, and after a while, if you decide, no, we need really, really performant thing, or we need to ship this binary, then you can rewrite it in C++. At least we have the proof of concept in Python. So if you're not familiar with the code, this is kind of the simplest thing that you can kind of write, you know, just a Q label uh, with a text there. And uh, as you are familiar from Qt, you know, you distinguish some stuff there, like Qt application, then you execute in the application. This is not a typo, it's just because this is a reserved word in Python, so we use an underscore there. And uh, the label, same idea, constructors and showing, and that's it. As you can see, it's kind of really straightforward to do. And since, of course, we are avoiding all the compiler process, it's, it's kind of like a nice to have. So for the example, I want to show you some pieces of code. And um, you will need to shout if it's not large enough. Can everyone read? What is it? Should I change the theme or the size? Everyone is OK? OK. So we will start showing like a step by step things. Of course, I will not do live coding with everything because if not, we will be like here and all the time. So this is kind of the main structure that we encourage people to use. This is kind of a, a way of having some main inside your Python script. So this will be executed only if you're executing this Python file directly. If this is getting imported, this is not being executed. So that's the idea of this main thingy here. So you see you have the Qt application execution that you have. And then we have the basic window uh, Qwidget base and show. Then we will have our class where we overload stuff, in this case from main window. So everything is, should be familiar so far. And then we, you know, usual Qt stuff, we send the, main, the, the central widget, some widget, and we were passing something here that if you are uh, not familiar with, this is the way from pandas, the thing that we already discussed, how you can read CSV, and then I am passing just this value there, just to have it. We don't know anything, right? Everyone is clear, I guess, with this example. So this, what does this show? I named this Windows, of course, because we haven't added anything, right? So at least we have that. We are starting somewhere. We have a white square there. So let's go a little bit further. Uh, if you execute this code, it would not work because I have some things that I have in my computer only, but uh, this is what I want for the future of Qt of Python in general with the interaction with other modules. Okay, I have this data frame and I want to show the data frame in a simple way, right? We are not talking about here performance, about you know the view model, you know, just, just keep it simple and just, I want to have the data frame, which is nothing else than a matrix, and I want to show it, and then, I want to add it to my layout. So in this case, you see something, if you're familiar with this, this type doesn't exist, this class doesn't exist because it's something that we're still working on. But uh, okay, so we have a data frame, so we, let's create a class called QDataFrame. So we are just adding that to the main. So you have there a table with the content of the CSV. Nothing outside this world. So of course, it's kind of convenient. I mean, of course, I know that maybe you want to format different columns in different ways. You want to keep track of the same precision, maybe eliminate some column, but let's do for the base that it would be quite convenient if you have a CSV file and then you create a Q data frame and you show it. And you have already some table that you can embed in whatever you want to use. So a Q data frame, I mean, this type that uh, we just uh, invented is nothing else that, uh, that a simple Class, right? I mean, let's let's wait. Let's look. So here, so as you can see here, it's nothing else like a simple widget, and we have some table view model inside that I know is not optimal. Here we are treating everything as a string. We're just placing without any precision of whatever. But this is not for us to take care of at the moment. I mean, the idea, of course, this class could have many other things to maybe change the model that I want to use inside my table view or list view or whatever view. So it's kind of convenient, right? I mean, you don't need to worry about this, this piece of code. Of course, if you really need to implement your own list view model, then you go for it. 
But otherwise, I think that uh, we cannot be, we cannot do anything that is simpler than this one. I guess that most of you maybe agree that it's kind of simple enough. Okay, so what do we have next? So in this case, we are adding a couple of other things. So again, same idea. I just want to add a figure, right? I don't care about all these 100 modules, right? I just want a figure there. And uh, the approach that we have just for this example, as I said, I just created two glasses like figure in canvas. It's kind of like to put something there. And then you are here, you have something that from your data frame, you're getting two random columns and you're plotting this thing with this also nice plot function. Simple enough. I mean, I know the figure canvas thing is kind of two, two way, but it's, it's kind of a hack to be able to update a plot later. So, so far, nothing is too uh, weird for you, I hope that, I mean, it's kind of like makes sense. So you have some figure in your class and then you have some function to plot the data, right? So here, I just put the data through random columns and then I have there some stuff. I didn't modify anything. I mean, I know here were dates, so I just tilted a little bit. But uh, again, it's just the simplest as we can get, a couple of lines of code and at least you can have just something to work with, right? Because maybe you have some file that you want to visualize and compare two columns and, or three columns or whatever. And then you're going to put stuff here. So in just a couple of lines of code, you can kind of get something that looks like a more like a data visualization tool that maybe you build from your own company or whatever, right? So I hope that everyone is still with me. You're not too lost. Uh, under the hood, the things that I was trying to do there um, are just a couple of hacks around Matplotlib, the thing that I mentioned before. Because as you know, Matplotlib, you can select different backends. And one of them is Qt. And they offer a really nice and easy way to have your plot inside a Q widget. So you can easily put this widget inside. So I will just put some some classes around to kind of hide, uh, to, 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 to hide all these things. But of course, maybe the idea will be when you define this figure, you kind of select which kind of uh, backend you want, right? I mean, I mentioned many modules, so maybe we can pick a couple of them and use them, depending on what you, what you want to use, right? So um, <clears throat> we show the number three, right? Yes. So on the fourth and um, and last, we are kind of a little bit more complicated things. So let's just execute it and then we can go for the code. <clears throat> so at least here, we just include that thing at the top. So we fix the x-axis for the date because it kind of makes sense. This data, if you didn't discover, is some earthquake information. That is kind of, it was the first CSV that I found. Um, so then you can have the option to, I don't know, change magnitude some other information that even know what it is, but uh, you can put it there. So as you can see, this is something that I, at least I discuss with many data scientists that they want easy ways to kind of navigate through the data and see how the data is behaving, right? Because it's an easy kind of like, if you have some maybe odd layers, it has a kind of like correlation between two values and you can kind of spot it if there's of course not millions of uh, rows, but it's kind of simple, right? But this as it is, is kind of an end user solution. So as good for Python, we cannot provide things like maybe like this, because it's kind of a specific for the plot and the table and maybe two axes and these kind of things. But the idea will be that, uh, well, not we don't have much time, but uh, that I really would like to see if some of you want to share maybe some use cases about data manipulation or what did you think that could be a really nice solution from Qt. Do we have some people here with some ideas that brave enough that want to say like, no, every day I need to go into Excel and I really hate it because we can also do that with Python. We can, you know, kind of like <clears throat> have a bunch of Excel files and then you can, I don't know, read uh, specific sheets and then export it to CSV, combine them, these kind of things. But again, just a matter of use cases. So is there, good, brave enough? Mm -hmm. uh, great program, and then we retrieve the data, and the data was from a Scala package. Mm -hmm. So it has a, a specific format. So it's a specific format, uh, uh, which is uh, reading the CSV plot, mm -hmm. and then uh, generate a, a strategy binary file. Mm -hmm. so this binary file, uh, if you do the, the 
Sakoma plus one by life, Sakoma, uh, you can read this uh, very quickly into Python. And uh, because in the future courses we use Freelancer and Mentor, it's harder. Yeah, it's harder, yeah. It's easier. So in Python, it's a really easy to create a uh, quick plot. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, uh, quickly do some things with Conda. So Conda is quite powerful. Um, like uh, in this, take the average. Yeah, of course, yes, yeah. Uh, it just generates the average. So you plot it and you see the, the original data and the average mm -hmm. data. Those kind of things. Um, then uh, the task is to find the moment of the problem. So you have data in mm -hmm. every half second after a year. Mm -hmm. I don't data, but, um, and then you need to find the spot where something happens. So this, you, you're looking for some uh, abnormal uh, uh, trends uh, for it. So uh, this can be done visually, uh, but of course you can also do this uh, programmatically, which is harder. Yeah. Uh, You can do it, yeah, easily. Yeah. For the people that is working here with data in C++, what is your way of going if you need to deal with CSV, for example? And someone, no, you never read with CSV? No? You were here just because you wanted to know what was 0.01 here? At some point, yeah. You want to say something? Exactly. <laughs> that is the thing, right? I mean, this is something that I have seen workflows of people kind of like reading data, manipulated with Python, and then, you know, generating other type of data, then they can do all these high performance things with C++ and maybe some parallel computing and stuff. But it's kind of like a, I don't know, I don't like this kind of like using separate things since we can bring it together. And that's kind of like the point of like the next talk that uh, uh, the idea also will be that if you already have your C++ project, it's no need to rewrite everything in Python again. You just expose it as it is. Or we can maybe, if we have some time, that we can also kind of see the other way around how you can put Python inside your C++ application and run the two, of the, the two things at the same time. So yeah, so um, this, uh, the, the motivation of this was of course, let me just uh, show you the, the equivalent code of this. So if you see it, I just want to put it in perspective. So in this case, is that piece, of course. It's, I mean, it's not too long. I mean, if you, if you consider that uh, most of the code is kind of boilerplate, that you need to kind of like, you know, add your widgets and everything. But this specific kind of handling types, like in pandas or data frames, series or matplotlib arrays, uh, sorry, or numpy arrays, or any, for example, tensors. If someone here is using PyTorch or TensorFlow, I mean, you know that maybe you can have a graphical representation of tensors. Or maybe you can have something that kind of reads the model. Do we have someone here that uses PyTorch by any, yeah? So you know in PyTorch you have access to the JIT. And there is a JIT you can you know, save your model in a format that also you can read from C++. So this is something that is, is really cool too, because also you kind of combined, again, Python, C++ together. So it's, uh, yeah. Do you, do you use uh, something else besides PyTorch? Or just? Yeah. And again, I mean, Torch is C++, right? So, so the back end, in this case. The research was mine, because it's so Of course, so. <clears throat> and this is something that, the, at the beginning, I don't know, maybe you're not familiar with the Python histories. At some point, it was kind of stalled, and maybe you remember something called, like, what's the name? R Ruby, maybe? It's something. At some point, Ruby was gaining a lot of attention, right? But then some people started to design something that was later um, called Django. Maybe you heard of Django as a web framework. This was kind of really powerful, competing with Ruby. And then everyone was like, okay. And then at some point it was this boom from data science and scientists using Python. And that's why every kind of single company that is doing something with data is doing Python. So that's why I think that we have the need to kind of like, one, be aware of what is out there, and also to see which type of solution we kind of build around it. 
So this is the data frame thing that I showed here. It's just a simple example, but uh, we can open. I know that we are still inside a good project, but uh, the features are kind of mainly motivated what someone dropping into the IRC channel and saying like, do you have support for this? And it's a no, but maybe we can do it. So it really depends to you. It's like, if you want to use Qt from Python in this way, and you want to have some abstraction classes, it really needs to come from, from one of your use cases. Because I mean, as I said, as a developer sitting in front of my computer, I will never figure out that maybe you have a problem with two types of Excel files or I don't know, combining data in an easy way. Some people I see some, sometimes people in data science that are not even used to the terminal. So simple things like counting rows, these kind of things, you know, some people do pipe WC minus L, whatever, they don't know. And they use Python for it and it's kind of kind of slow. So I think that at some point we need to combine these things. And I don't know if you believe that uh, it's a good way for Qt to jump into all these machine learning things. Do you have any strong feelings with it? Because I mean, from the Python point of view, it makes sense, right? But would it make sense to have something from the C++ point of view? Maybe, as I said before, for example, Torch, PyTorch is based on Torch, Torch is C++. Maybe we can have something like, I don't know, Q Torch or something. <laughs> Yeah. In the next talk, there will be one example with PyBind. So um, the thing that I wanted to show this code is that <clears throat> the main motivation to create these classes that eliminate boilerplate is because um, I didn't open the website, so maybe it will be. Hopefully, it will open. So if you type pisa.org, you get reached the main wiki, so you have all the information there. I gave a webinar about creating a visual uh, data representation tool. So uh, tutorials. And it was, again, with all this uh, earthquake uh, information from CSB. Why earthquakes? Because I come from a country that we have earthquakes really often. And uh, I was writing this code. On, for the webinar, and I finished it, but I felt like, I mean, this is, this is the final version of the code. <laughs> so it's like a lot. And it was just for showing some plot and some table. So even though I know that it's really nice that you can own, you write your own models and view, I think that is a good way to maybe do some, start to doing some abstractions on top of Cube of Python, maybe to start to dedicate some extra modules for all these numerical things, so you can have for free and in one line some simple table. Of course, if as I said, if you want more performance or whatever, you can write your own thing. But having this thing, I think it is really, really handy for tomorrow. Maybe if you are dealing with this data that you were mentioning, it, and then you have a class that just shows the data and the plot in a couple of lines, that will be more than enough. So. Uh, going back to the presentation, <clears throat> as I showed, maybe uh, if uh, I guess that most of you kind of walk around the booth, but uh, they were showing three different examples. Uh, well, four. Um, I only have three here. The first one is a matplotlib integration that maybe you saw. There was this uh, 3D plot because thanks to matplotlib being based in Qt for that backend, it's helpful for us to kind of merge it. There was another camera one that you can do load some um, trained models to detect the face of someone. Is someone here didn't go to the booth? No, everyone? Okay, so you know what I am talking about. And the other one is of some scikit image that you can apply virtual to images. So these three examples that you, that you saw there, it will be soon in the official repository so you can check it out. But uh, it's really straightforward and that's the idea at least for the next step of Qt for Python to be more integrated in the other in the Python ecosystem itself. So this is the more important part that was just really highlighting all the time that we really need to base the next steps on the, your point of view, your use cases. Because to do all this abstraction, we need to know what is needed, only, right? So yeah, that's, that will be it. I will put all the slides and the code uh, online, even this fake class, uh, so you can check it out and with more time. And I don't know if now you have some, some general questions. I remember that yesterday in the keynote, uh, there was some question about Qt for Python in the future. If you have some question regarding to that, maybe it's, we can see some hands. But uh, yeah, that will be it. Thanks. <clears throat> Do you have some questions?
Officially, yes. I mean, the thing that we have now is the Shibogen thing. So you can have Python code running inside C++ application. Or you are the other way around, running C++ inside Python. No, Python inside Python. <coughs> oh, okay, yeah. And for this, I recommend you to go to the blog. Uh, the last, I mean, if you go to the, it's kind of tricky to get there, but uh, if you go to the blog.qt.io, there is one post about the vision of Qt for Python. And then you have uh, what we are offering to C++ developers. And then you have one example there that is showing this thing. It's an editor, well, maybe see if we can open it, but maybe it will take some time. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of the example that everyone is using. So you go here, down here. I was explaining this example, many people in the booth that were kind of interested in the same thing. So if you're not, maybe I can repeat it. So you can, <clears throat> This white application there is C++ and Qt, right? So it's a simple widget. And the first problem is that you cannot read anything, right? So the first thing that we are doing with uh, Python is to increase the fonts of the application itself. So this is dynamically, because since we have access to the, the Qt application singleton, we can load it from Python, create a binding for it, and we can have complete control of the whole thing. Uh, so the, the next idea, of course, here is that at the same time, you can maybe iterate the menu bar and kind of like uh, start to do something about it. Because you will have access to the quick, clear run about Qt uh, actions. And then the only thing that you need to do is that, in this case, it's just a simple example of changing the text of something that is already there loaded. <coughs> and I will just change it to something really stupid. So again, and it's, it modify the thing. So it is possible. It's not straightforward in the sense of you don't need to like two lines and it works. You do you know, some linking and everything, but it's possible. And inside the repository, you can have it. It's called scriptable application. So you can give it a try. Do you have another question? <clears throat> no? OK. So